Hello, everyone. Uh, usually I start the show by saying hello, IU fans, and welcome to Who's Your Heartland podcast. But this is a little bit of a different episode tonight than obviously a lot of our friends and family, especially Who's Your Fans, too, that, that follow our podcast show or, are very aware of uh, our situation with our older brother, uh, John Malcolmson. And uh, what we wanted to do is we, we had a show planned for Sunday. Obviously, that, that was going to be our part three of our teammate series with Mike Evans, who is also probably uh, most likely catching this show live, if not later on. And, and, you know, that was postponed, obviously, because of the events that happened last week. But this is all about John. And what, what I had mentioned on Facebook, I threw this idea past Robbie earlier today. Uh, whenever we had just finished up funeral arrangements and I told him that, you know, we, we got to talk about COVID-19 and what that's going to be like for the funeral home and people coming and going and what, you know, how's those rules and stuff be, how's it going to affect everybody. And there's got to be many of you that's still really weary about going out in public, especially to, to a gathering of this sort. The last thing we want to do is people to get to get ill or anything from from being there just to support our family. So some of you might feel too uncomfortable to go. Some of you might have work constraints. So uh, like I told Robbie, they have a max capacity of 50. But I'll, I'll tell you this truth there. I mean, I, I don't know how hard that's going to be in for, you know, reinforced or something like that, but it's still uh, that's kind of the thing. So people will be kind of flowing in and out. Uh, they've kind of give us different tips there in a constructive way to try to manage that. Uh, but we really appreciate it. I know a lot of you probably will be there and, and more than anything, that means a lot to us. But the idea was, you know, we wanted to do certain things for the service. And then I told Robbie, you know, there's going to be people that's not going to be able to be there a lot, you know, whether it's, it's proximity reasons or whatever. And why not us do something on our show and, and share that? That's the main part of this is to share that story that I that I mentioned on the pre-show part. Uh, the tragic tale of John Malcolmson. So Robbie and I is going to read that together. But it's it's important in the sense that you're going to read the exact transcript uh, from it that Robbie and I are exactly going to share during John Matt's memorial service to honor him. So mom and all of her family and people that are there will hear that. You're going to hear that now in advance, or you're going to hear this for at least the first time. The second time will be later. So we we want to kind of do a little bit of an intro. And then we're going to cover that story. We also have a slideshow, but I'd like to just kind of bounce around on share screen a little bit, if you all don't mind, and just uh, share different other photos of John Matt that's not in the slideshow. Some that that uh, that uh, his ex-wife Becky had sent me it was a lot of memories there with the kids, and I'm pretty sure she sent me some video clips even. So I'm going to throw that in share screen later and be able to to show you guys that. So we'll all be watching it together, and I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So that's going to be something that we'll all see together. And, and uh, so that'll be a special moment. Other than that, uh, Robbie, is there anything you want to start with? Is there, you're on mute right now, Robbie. Sorry. I just wanted to reiterate what you said earlier again. Um, you know, the YouTube chat, I don't know how many of you know how it works, but it's probably about five to 10 seconds lag behind what's, what's happening actually live. But if you have any questions or, or comments, if you have a story that you actually feel like typing up, you know, some of and you don't feel comfortable saying out loud, type it in the chat and me and Ben or Kathy will be happy to read it out loud to share to everybody else. Um, you know, we, we even thought about maybe doing it to where we had a, a Zoom thing where people could still join the meeting like the way Kathy or I do. And then you could share it. We could give you a chance to share out loud if you wanted to be able to do that too. But like I said, Ben and I going to do that tonight. Uh, what might be more interested, some of you just may want to know more about our brother. Something that Ben and I loved getting asked at the, when we first got to the hospital a couple of days ago, the chaplain, the people from the donor incorporation, they, uh, they asked us, can you describe John's character? Any of you that know me well know, don't give me an open-ended question like that <laughs> without expecting me to go on for 10 or 15 minutes about what it is. Thankfully at the funeral, and I'll probably say it at the funeral service Thursday, that Ben's made us a nice script and he's told me exactly what to say. So I'll stay next to that. That way people like John Kleeman or others that want to say something can do that. And I don't ramble on uh, too long. So thank you, Ben, for doing that. I don't think that you have tonight divided up on the, when we tell the story, Ben, do you already have it divided up between what parts you're going to read and what part of the time I'm going to read? Or are, we, are you just going to I, I say, emailed hey, that to, I emailed that to you earlier. Did you get it? Um, yeah. Yep, I, mean, I, I got, it. It. got I can it. to you again, but that, that already has – it's set up like similar, like our show plan. It's got like our, our names next to each part and it's broken down the way, the way I was at least envisioning it the best way that it would do it. But it is, it is different than the one you read before because I've reworded certain things because of events changing. 
but Robbie did sum that up well. It was difficult to describe John Matt because there's so many layers for you all that know him. There's so many layers to his personality. But the very first thing I think me and Robbie said when they asked us to describe him was he's an alpha. <laughs> alpha. <laughs> and and uh, so he 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 likes that, and he's uh, he liked the control. He liked. I ain't saying that in a bad way. Just it, he is. Uh, he had always been in that position where, and you guys all know this. He's smart. He 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 had. I don't know he had the he had brains that were much more. Uh, I don't know what you would call it. like they were just better the way they worked than what me and Robbie's does. He just had like photographic memory, especially when it came to book smarts. He could like read something one time and he'd be good. And, uh, but more than anything, he also was very dedicated to his job and, and, and he loved his profession. And, and I think that, uh, to be honest with you, just to get like really into it, there, there was a lot of, that was one of the biggest challenges with John was that adjustment phase after post aortic aneurysm thing where that went on for months. Uh, you know, it took a, it took a hell of a time for him to adjust because it, it had to change his entire lifestyle. He was already you know, hampered. We had complications. He had partial of his foot amputated. So he was already handicapped from that. And he was not used to doing that for y'all. know, I mean, he was used to being active. I mean, so to have that ripped from him, it was really difficult for him to, to change that for him a lot. And then that was part of the struggle. I mean, for those that read the story, there, there's battles within that alone of just trying to Robbie and I trying to figure out different ways to get through to him that, you know, you know, dude, as much as you don't want to change your life you know it's been changed for you uh, that decision's already been made and and i think he knew that it's just coming to terms with that you imagine being in that position it's it's difficult and that was a, a challenge for us to uh, emotionally and psychologically to face that but but he, he did make efforts and then there was there was a lot of challenges and struggles there uh, obviously other health problems happen along the way too that hampered him more. I mean, he had, he had blood clots and issues there. He had surgeries there that caused, I mean, he had nerve damage. So he, he had, he had really sensitive, uh, to pain within his right arm and in his leg. So even like walking like normal was a, was a, was a distraction. It, it caused him a lot of pain. So, but I remember him at the one time, Robbie used to recall this time when he told us about, uh, he, he would feel like a leech. He would feel like he was not doing anything productive, especially when he moved here to Twilight Towers and in Tell City for a little while. He felt like uh, he wasn't contributing anything to society. Is uh, But it wasn't like, you know, what was me, you know, in my life now? It was just like he was trying to find his way. And Robbie said, Robbie, you said it best over that conversation with them. It, he was starting to get some traction of what he actually wanted to do and then the stroke happened but Robbie I would rather you share that part because do you remember like flashback to that part whenever John Matt and you, you kind of dawned on John Matt and you remember what we saw yeah. in his apartment can you tell us that story real quick well without rambling uh, with a little bit of contextualization um, many of you that were close to our father John Arthur Malcolmson you know, back in, in 2004 and five, whenever he was diagnosed with cancer, Ben, I, I'm sure you remember when that large tumor was in his left leg, um, there was some, a, a, a concern between me and you and mom and, and John Matt that dad might lose his leg, that the, the tentacles of the tumor were like wrapped around all this stuff. And he was fortunately able to keep that. But I remember all of us discussing philosophically, like, what effect is that going to have on dad's psyche if he were to lose his leg? You know, dad, a lot, like all of us, he valued a lot of himself, not just as a father, but as a worker. And he worked really hard his whole life. And we worried about, you know, would dad be okay if he couldn't work the same that he used to again? Um, now we go back to John, Ben, you know, three weeks, I think it was about three weeks. It was in June before when we were having a cookout at your house. At this point, me and you and John, we're all getting along really well. We're getting them cracking up. You know how you and I are. We're just nonstop making jokes getting John laughing and he opens up with us uh, up with us a little bit more about um, his concerns. And like Ben, he's kind of going through what we would call an existential crisis. Um, there's this kind of a value effect there of, you know, it's not just men, a lot of people, uh, whether it's after retirement or after an injury or an accident, they may have to redefine what they do again. And all of us, I think, want to feel like we are needed, um, whether it's our family relationships, um, professionally, what they are. John was, 
you know, we all have our ghost in the closet. He had parts about his personal life that, I, that he had regrets for, just like we all do. But whenever he worked, he was just like a, a superhero. He was just like LeBron James of his job. I never heard complaints about him as a paramedic, as a flight paramedic, as a police officer. He just, you know, dedicated himself and took it very seriously. And people he mentored, it meant a lot. So to not to have those physical limitations now, Ben, that you mentioned, the amputations, um, the, the hit that they caused him to have happen and just other problems, he would not be able to work anymore. So the idea of going on disability, I think it really hind hindered him psychologically. And it, it, he had stumbled since 2015, I think, of trying to really redefine himself again, going through depression or family has been as shared on the show very candidly before. And we all have, we take mental health very seriously. We've all struggled with it in the family and we still do. But about three weeks before his stroke, he tells me and Ben that he has a, you know, he's just kind of concerned on kind of figuring out what he wants to do next. And Ben and I reminded him what people came to the hospital and said about him. This is really important for the listeners that can't make it to the funeral. I said this to John Cleveland, his best friend, about an hour or so ago. I said, the fact that the day that he had his aortic uh, aneurysm, his dissection, um, it was packed. There was like at least 50, 60 people or so in the waiting room. And Ben and I had a gentleman come up, and Becky remembers this, his ex-wife, that one of the gentlemen came up and he said, your brother John fired me. And I'm here because I respect him that much. How often does that really happen where you fire people and they still have the utmost respect for you because he treated them like a man. He was very respectful to him. He knew he had made a mistake, but he, he still cared a lot about uh, that having so what I'm saying is that the way he carried himself, his character, his professionalism, Becky would tell us that he would people would offer him money to train them on how to do job interviews, how to do speeches. Ben, you remember, and most of everybody in this chat remembers the two years after the aortic dissection, John went on a little tour where he would go around to different places and do lectures. He even came in my classroom, my students, and the first time I, any of my family had ever been in my classroom, which I also care about probably too much to that extent, he was in there um, and, and got to speak to all my kids and share his story. So Ben and I reminded him that you're a fantastic public speaker and you, you're a great teacher. You've mentored so many people. Why don't you do what I do? Why don't you do? You're academically intelligent. There's nothing about your physical limitations that will prevent you from being an educator. And I remember Ben, he looked at us and he's like, he had that, that enlightened kind of light bulb moment. But I remember him saying to me and Ben as, as a realist, he's like, but what if something happens to me? What if, he said, what if I die right in the middle of going to school? And I was like, who gives a shit? And he's like, who cares if you die? And I, and I was just like, the fact that you would be doing this every day and you'd be going to class is like, you, you have your purpose again. You're, you're driven again. And if you make it all the way through, then great. If, if something happens while you're going through it, you, you can at least say you tried to get to that point. And sadly, about three days after Ben and I, it's also proudly, but it's also sad, about three days after his stroke, Ben and I and my ex-wife, who I'm still really close to, Cassie, we went and cleaned up John's apartment and organized everything. We were talking to Becky a lot about, you know, Adel Adeline's toys and whatnot. And right on the counter, Ben remembers this, there are two textbooks and a sheet from Ivy Tech University near Elizabethtown. And it says, congratulations, your classes will start at the end of August. Here are your class sets that were on there. And I looked at Ben, I was like, he freaking did it. Like, he, I got goosebumps now just, just thinking about it. He actually did it. He, he signed up and he was going to start doing that. That tells me that's not a guy that's given up on life. A guy that signs in and invests more of his limited funds on a fixed income to do that. So that tells me, Ben, that whenever that did happen to him, unfortunately, nobody knows when a stroke's going to happen. Uh, the fact that he was able to, to keep doing that and he was going to continue his professional career. And I think he would have really found that value there and inspire people furthermore. I just think that's great. I know it's a long way of telling it, but Ben, I think you agree to know all of that context is really important to really get the, the full scope and impact of that story. Yeah, I do. And I think you did a good job of, of laying that out for people because like I started getting goosebumps too. I should, I should uh, give everybody a warning beforehand because I'm sure that, uh, you know, John meant a lot of, to a lot of people. And a lot of people in Clawson, we're all, a lot of people here back home know him and refer to him as John Matt. So if you hear us say John Matt, that, that's because it's short for John Matthew Malcolmson, his full name. But a lot of his close friends would know him that they, 
Robbie and I picked up on that. We, we would call him that too. I've tried to change that over the years, but when my instincts kick in, I always go to John Matt uh, overall. And like Robbie had said today, he kind of, he kind of hated that. That was one of the things that he kind of, not that he hated it, but he just kind of, whenever he moved away, that's something he kind of wanted to branch out from. And he, he found it like it was almost more of a professional level when people would refer to him as John. But what I was going to say is, you know, we're going to apologize in advance if Robbie and I or, or Kathy get emotional during the show, but I, I'm expecting some laughs and, and some tears and, and things like that, especially whenever we get around to reading a story. Um, but Robbie, yeah, you, you said that well. Like I said, it, it's it's tough to wrap all this up. I'd love to get Kathy the chance to, to jump in here and just comment on anything. But Kathy, is there anything that you wanted to start with or just see if you wanted to comment on Robbie's story? No, I just wanted to thank you both so much for sharing that story because it really lays the foundation of what we're going to talk tonight, talk about tonight. And it really, really helped me. I mean, I never met John. Um, I'd heard a lot about him, but he seems like an insanely smart guy who took a lot of pride in his work, worked really hard. He wanted to make a difference and he did. Um, and that was just a really powerful story on that enlightened moment that he had. And I love the fact that you went and saw those textbooks sitting there. It's almost symbolic, kind of like from a movie. Um, so that was very powerful and thank you for sharing. Sorry, I don't Again, mean to. Just, yeah. Kathy, ahead, thank Robert. you so much for saying that. Um, and while you both were talking there, I just got curious and I went back to John Matt's um, Facebook page. And I tell you what, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to share a screen or, or what Ben yet. I don't know if it would let me share a screen, but there was just one funny thing that anybody that knows John, especially the hey, professor. can, side, can make you host, but you have to turn it back over I will, over I'll turn it right back over to you. I just want to show something that I think is I really fitting. Um, I just made you host. Okay, so I'll go back to this. I'm just going to show you this. So just look at his Facebook page and look at this. So former badass paramedic, proud dad, <laughs> and very soon to be a published author. He was in the middle of writing his autobiography, which my ex-wife, uh, you know, she was a professional. You know, she's an independent but professional editor at the time. She helped him edit the book, which we still have a copy of that. I think that if anybody wanted to read that at some point, we have we never did send it off to a publisher. But I think that it was really well like written. And if he didn't get around to making the edited changes that Cassie recommended, I will go back for him and make those changes. Well, I was going to um, say, Robbie, I think between the, the two of us, we could yeah. probably write it for him based yeah. off of the stuff that he, he had that, yeah. that, that, that would mean a lot to him. So you know, that's, that's And this is why I love the fact that people will go on social media and say that happy birthday. They say, I miss him. Like Melissa did there. It's like, you, you know, it's social media. We believe it. If there's anything with the soul or something like that, then maybe some way they kind of get that. And Ben, you see the Cardinal background and the site that all of us miss desperately, which is a, an actual crowd and not cardboard cutouts of what people look like. I, I just happened to go on there whenever she was talking. I saw that badass paramedic part. And I was just like, how awesome is that? The fact that that's like how charismatically how he did because, you know, he's coming, he's not like narcissistic, but he knew that he is, he's intelligent. He knew that, that, and, uh, and again, like even in desperate situations, like Ben says that he was so good at keeping his calm under duress in situations that most of us would just absolutely panic in. So yeah, Kathy, thank you for saying everything you did earlier. I, I agree a second that you did share screen, Robbie. We'll you never make you a host. Just make me a host again, just so I, in case yeah. I didn't forget. I anyway. got you. But no, it's a great shirt. And that kind of sums up, uh, John, it made me think of whenever, uh, and that quote that I talked about that I'll share in a minute, I, I can't get credit for that. That's something that Becky had shared with me because she's she always, his, his ex-wife, Becky, who they were still friends. They were still really good friends after the divorce. Um, uh, she had shared that story with me when they had, they had talked about being an organ donor back in the day and John Matt made the joke like, you know, who wouldn't want a piece of this? And that kind of made me think of whatever <laughs> said badass paramedic. I mean, as soon as I said that, I, I can see John Kleeman or those people that know him real well, like Gil Ski and all them being like, yeah, that sounds like John. Uh, that definitely sounds like him even just to get a rise out of people. Uh, but like I said, it, it, I wish we could probably sit here for hours and hours just sharing stories and, and, and comments. And I, I it's just really hard to know where exactly to start. Uh, I know, like I said, before we really share the story, uh, there, there's some important, like, and this is more on the, the somber end, the, the harder end for us. And again, apologize if, if we get emotional or whatever. It's just, uh, you mentioned, like, a, and you're going to see in his obituary in, in Hubert Funeral Home, I wanted to mention them too, that they were, uh, 
they had seen things that me and Robbie have done on social media and things like that. So they gave us the honor of writing his obituary. So if you happen to go to HuberFuneralHome.com where you've seen that shared on platforms, his obituary was uh, done by Robbie and myself. And, uh, and we probably could have kept that going even longer. I mean, it's, it's going to be one of the longer obituaries that you've probably seen for somebody. But, but like Julie Hoover even said, we, this is a chance to do something special. And it's not to diminish the, the importance of other people's obituaries, but, you know, uh, this is like trying to honor John. So uh, we put that together and the family seen it and I, it looked like people really liked it. So that, that was thrilled for me and Robbie. But anyways, just going back, like we mentioned in the obituary towards the top about the, the past six years being a challenge and just going over that alone is, is, is trying, but there's a lot of things that happened that led up to, like I said, the hardest thing, for Friday, like this weekend, obviously it led up to this month, this morning when he passed away. But uh, you know, Friday was when it really started rolling. Uh, Thursday morning into Friday, and things just turned dark so fast. And and it, when we've had a lot of scares along the way, but it got it got serious really fast that morning. Uh, it went from being like an evaluation to uh, we got a, a major problem, and. Uh, but but like looking back on it though, there's a lot of things that happened this weekend where Robbie and I were thinking of the same thing or feeling the same thing, and then we would say that to each other. And and like Robbie had talked about earlier, that the hardest thing for me and Robbie at first to grasp is we knew the day was going to come, most likely where me and him would be standing over John Matt uh, in that position, having to make the tough choice to to take him off a vent or to to let him go. And and but the the thing is, you know. Years ago, those uh, that knew our father, John, uh, John Matt was the rock in that situation. And he, and he managed things and he was there for dad more on that level, physically in transit and all these other things, facilitating a lot of things for dad. So we all three were there for three days, just slowly watching dad slip away. And, and it had brought us closer, but it's weird. It's like, it's weird how those, those traumatic situations bring you closer. So that actually mended me and Robbie's relationship with John. And, and we became a lot closer, uh, even more so after there was a lot of friction early on building up into that through the through the time for different reasons. But it brought us closer together. But it, it was just a powerful thing. You know, John was physically there with with our with our uh, I still call her you know to our family. Just like I say this with Becky, but Michelle uh, Tinsley, John's first wife, her and, and our aunt Judy, who's probably watching the show live tonight. They were all there whenever Dad you know, took his last breath. And the weird, the weird thing is dad uh, had made the comments. I, I, I can't remember who it was, like somebody, I'm going to say it to mom, but he, he really didn't want us to see him go. So uh, it was crazy, like how that all worked out because it, he went whenever no one was really uh, sitting there watching him in that moment. So, but it was peaceful and, and there was nothing wrong with that. Uh, but like to, to say that it was just a powerful moment. I could tell you a good story there too, but I, I don't know. It's, I'm kind of rambling there, but it, but that that's just a long line of, of different things. But every family's had through things that I have so many friends friends this year that have alone that have dealt with different traumatic things that were way more serious than what we've gone through, or or, or just as bad. And we're all thinking of you too. So we're all kind of in this together. But just the last six years to sum that up. You know, John Matt had that aortic aneurysm that that just about took his life. He spent 19 hours uh, plus, I think, in, under under the knife during that initial surgery, and we were all there as a family. Uh, I mean, just up for hours and hours and hours waiting. That that went on for months of him recovering. And looking back on John, didn't even remember the first four months because he was so far under. He doesn't even recall. He just remembers the only thing that he would always say. It was that he remembered dad being there with him, but in the version of a child. It wasn't dad like you guys all, a lot of us remember that whenever he passed away, it was him as a child. And, and he would just be there around. I remember being in the CCU room and he was playing hide and seek with John Matt. John Matt was looking behind me and everything and he was laughing. And again, I know he's drugged up and everything so people can think whatever they want. But it, but it was just kind of in a fun, playful way that he just like, you know, he was doing all that. And he, and he told Becky, I think it was that, you know, dad's here and he's, he's, he's hiding and he's jumping back out and everything. But usually he would always say that dad would sit in the back window uh, of the room that he was in and just kind of be there in, in the background. And he said there was one time when I was there, he kept looking between me and mom and he was saying that uh, that he was seeing dad, the child version of dad, standing between me and mom. 
when we were standing by his bed. But I still remember him telling us the story about the time that he came and went is that he got, he climbed up out of the, the, uh, the windowsill and walked up to John's bed and he said, he put his hand on me, said, you know, I, I, I have to go and you're going to, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be okay. So, um, but anyways, it was a, it was a special memory there, but that, that was a rough time. And, uh, and then obviously fast forward to just different problems here and there that he dealt with. We talked about the mentality earlier, but you know, the, the stroke thing happened and it was a difficult thing for all of us. And I, I think a lot of people had a hard time wrapping their mind, like, you know, different strokes can happen. Coach McClinic, I know you're watching and you've, you've had to deal one with yourself. We've had a, we had a really powerful conversation on the phone that I'll never forget uh, with him. But, uh, but John had a massive stroke and we still to this day don't know how long he had been there. Um, I just remember, uh, I know a lot of people was kind of wonder how that was. John lived on his own and, uh, and Becky and I both had an awful feeling like something was wrong that morning because she hadn't heard from him recently. And, uh, which is not uncommon for me and Robbie to go days on, in, days on end without talking to him. But I remember us going there and it was Becky and myself that found John Matt. And I knew, I, I don't know if Becky knew right away, but I think she might've, but didn't want to, but I knew right away whenever I seen him, I was like, I think he's had a stroke. Uh, and uh, I, again, I don't know how long he had been there. So that, that really took a toll on me uh, early on. I don't think I was shaken more besides that day until yesterday but uh but anyways he you know he had that massive stroke and that that impaired him severely he we like Robbie and I said uh, and to tell all of you there was a part of John Matt that we lost last year and and Robbie I don't know if you want to jump in there because I've been going for a little while but uh, can you describe that kind of conversation you and I had about you know what that loss was like and then kind of lead up to where we are now you know, th this is one of those times, again, where death could be viewed in more than just one way, more than just the tangible side about when you think that there's the non-existence of life, but it's more of like, I think there's, there, there could be symbolic or smaller, you know, sacrifices that go through your life. And, and you're right, Ben, whenever that happened before, you felt like you lost something, to, something unique about John that was there before. Uh, he could communicate with you, but he, from now on, he can only really, for the most part, say yes or no. He he shocked us one time that the, the speech therapist they had been working with him so hard uh, at the clinic, and it made me, me and Ben choke up because uh, it was this last year on uh, Mother's Day, the the last one around. They had, they, I think it was Mother's Day or his mom's birthday, Ben. It might have been something like that, or Mary. It might have been Christmas, but like. I think that John was able to say to mom on the phone, they put the phone up to him. He was able to say, mom, I love you. Uh, or something that he said, Merry Christmas. Oh, I love you. Oh, that, and that we could not believe that. You know, that actually yeah, happened a lot yeah. sooner. Even that happened like yeah. uh, back in uh, July, I think it was just out of the blue. That was the most happiness I've seen mom was, uh, cause he'd been going through all this therapy and, and yeah. honestly yeah. it was, it was refreshing because Robbie and I, uh, and it was really hard to, to try to, to describe for this to describe this to mom that we had believed that John Matt had plateaued and the people that at the nursing home might agree, might disagree. It's just the feeling that we got because they put so much work in. It's not to diminish them either. But there, but we knew going in this time around that, that they told us at Louisville Hospital initially that we're looking at maybe a 25 to 30 percent improvement in John Matt's state because it, it was such a significant stroke and he, he had been down for so long. Uh, uh, it, it just, uh, it, it took a lot out of him. But one of the things that we really wanted him to regain was communication and speech. And, and you try and talk to him and there's sometimes he'd, he'd know it. And there's other times where he'd say yes and he'd mean no, or he'd say no and mean yes. And you can see him getting frustrated. So it's like he's battling two different sides of himself in his head. And, and you feel for him. And, and it's just really hard because you feel like you're having a one side conversation. Like I, I do want to mention my, our cousin, Laura, uh, our, our cousin Chris Melton's wife, we still consider her famous. I'm calling her cousin, <laughs> but we we had a conversation about uh, beating ourselves up about the nursing home, and and it was hard. It was hard. My aunt, uh, you know, she's also talked about too. That's there's a lot of uh, uh, things that come from the nursing home. That's where our grandfather was at, and that was that our dad and Judy's dad. That's where he passed away, and it was just difficult for all of us to face that. But anyways, John was just. Uh, it was hard for him to talk a lot. So any little progress here and there was significant, but we went through a long period there where it, it wasn't really seemed like it was changing much. And all of a sudden out of the blue one day, 
one of the nurses calls up mom and says that, uh, you know, John, Matt, I'm, I'm about to get emotional again, Rob, you might have to say this. And, uh, I can but, take over for you. Go man. Ahead. you but that, that's what was it was. said, you know, I, it, it, uh, it, okay, I think I'm okay now. But he said, you know, uh, the nurse said that uh, John was wanting to tell you, you know, something. So she didn't know what was going to say, if it was going to be something bad or good. And keep in mind, mom's hearing is, is, a, is, a, is a real serious challenge. So for the fact that she even heard this was like it was meant to be. But she, she like, I guess, gave the phone to John Matt. And John Matt said to the phone, you know, I think he said, like, hi, mom, I love you, or I love you, mom. Yeah. But for him to say that whole sentence – that just small sentence that we all say like within just and don't even think about it on a daily basis was uh, more moving the mom than I mean she called me crying with tears of joy to and to Robbie too just to tell us that and yes that happened like fairly recently I want to say that was July I think whenever that happened uh, someone can feel free to comment that they're they're from the nursing home that never remember that but still that was that was really significant but just to kind of get back on track there again, I'm trying to just give you guys all a little bit of background, just how how powerful uh, a lot a lot of telling this has all been for for the family. Just it's for him especially the not to lose focus, but obviously the family gets affected and there's a lot of stress and and and, uh, and emotions there. But but yeah, then the, whenever what happened the other night is basically just to walk you all through it is. Uh, I was in contact with the nursing home. We had just talked earlier that day about his blood. And uh, and they were they were basically monitoring that because they noticed that his blood you know, it was not in a great situation. It was on it was on the thin side. I'm not going to go into the details about whether that was, but it was kind of like, uh, hey, you know, let's not stop the presses. Let's all freak out. But it, it was like, you know, let's let's just you know, they're monitoring and they're going to test him again shortly after that. And, and it, nothing had gotten serious yet. But then after that conversation, within like a two hour span, everything just really started shifting. Uh, quickly, uh, John, uh, uh, another nurse called me and, and had told me that John was had become like unresponsive. He was like there, but they couldn't get him to respond back to him. And he had these, uh, I'm not actually getting choked up this time, I promise, but he had these like specks in his eyes and, and uh, they, they wanted to take him to Perry County to, for, for evaluation. So they just let me know that. So I said it might be a while. Well, they took him there. Hours went by. We get a call from uh, Perry County. They're transferring him to Deaconess Gateway in Evansville because they believe that he might have meningitis. So uh, he was showing signs of swelling, uh, uh, specks and stuff were forming on his forehead and nose. He was still unresponsive, not responding to them. His eyes had turned bloodshot. Um, so he was just kind of there and, and not saying anything. But they took him there, and an, another hour or two went by. And then I, I got a call from one of the doctors at, at the hospital in Evansville, and I could tell right off the bat, her, her way on the tone, that it, it had gotten very serious. She's like, listen, you know, I have to be frank with you. Uh, your situation for your brother is a lot more critical than what we, we expected whenever he was uh, diagnosed at Perry County and brought here. Uh, I was like, he, he's bleeding profusely in the brain. It's out of control. Uh, you know, here's your options, bam, bam, bam. And I was like, whoa. Like, like I didn't say that out loud, but it's just like all of a sudden I went from we're, we're kind of monitoring and all of a sudden now I'm having to make a decision on his life. And and, uh, and I was like, listen, you know, we talked about it. I was like, I'm going to have to call you back. I have got to talk to Robbie. And, and then, of course, fast forward, we went through all that and we had to make the call uh, to for his best interest to pull him off the vent. But that's when the donor process started and all that came about, which we're going to get into more. But I think, Robbie, I don't know. I, I know we keep rambling, and I hope that's not real bothering. That's a Malcolmson thing <laughs> that we do. But uh, I would like to go ahead and use this time to tell the story, Robbie, if you're comfortable going well, ahead. Ben, do, do you mind? Uh, I don't know if, like, you do you have any, like, sense of humor stories. I know that when we were kids, John used to make a sport out of scaring me and you. He would tell us like up at, up at like Rocky Point, there was like a haunted house that, you know, people would hunt it down out there and stuff like that. He he prided. Uh, me and Ben were down in the basement playing. He'd put his mouth next to the vent and he'd start whispering things. And me and Ben would think it's voices and we'd scream for mom every time and go running upstairs. But Ben, I don't know if you have uh, any humorous stories to tell. I know that Caleb, his his uh, you know his youngest son and I were talking yesterday. And he shared the story. So, Caleb, I apologize if I screw it up at all, but it, it was good because he said, you know, when he spent time with his dad, you know, he would he would even kind of play around with him a little bit. So he was with his dad shortly after work at some point, and some of his work supplies was in the in the jeep or in the car, like his stethoscope. So when little Caleb, 
he like picks up the, steth- the stethoscope, puts the ear things on and starts to try to hear something with it. And I think John somewhere along the line says like, um, do you hear anything or are you sure you should be playing with that? And Caleb, little Caleb's like, well, well why? And he's like, cause I, I just got done using that on a dead guy. <laughs> and it just freaked Caleb out and he like threw it down. But Caleb knows that he was just like messing with him now looking back. And again, that's another Malcolmson thing too. Anybody that's been with us at the hospital the last three days or so is there's a strong and morbid sense of humor within us. And I, and I'm sure, and we've heard this from the people that work at the hospital. If you're a paramedic or uh, a nurse or anything like that. I think everybody, you have to have a, a pretty strong sense of humor to be able to, to kind of not just lose your mind in, in, in a job like that. Um, but I thought that was a, a great story to hear that I've never heard before that Caleb shared with me yesterday. And I'm sure over the next, uh, on Wednesday and Thursday, Ben, we'll probably hear stories from people uh, about John that we didn't know before too. And and, uh, and again, it's just interesting to share, but I didn't know if you had anything to share too, Ben. It might've been a little humorous before we could jump into <laughs> it's hard, the story. It's hard to think on the spot there. I will say there, there's a, there's a funny, there's a funny story that ties into the, the story that we're going to read there. So I'm not going to touch on that, but the, the only way I can sum that part up is that there, there's just so many different moments. It's hard to think of one right now off the fly, but I know that like Robbie said, when me, Robbie, and John Matt were around, we were, we we never were one of us where we're like, okay, guys, that's enough. We're gonna draw the line here where the humor's at. We would actually just, uh, and like Letha, who's Robbie's girlfriend, would would attest to this too. That that when we're around each other, we just keep pushing that bar and it just keeps going. And eventually, we're all three just laughing about whatever it is. And Letha's like that too. She so we had a lot of laughs today. Just this, it was therapeutic. But that, I, that's what I think of John Maz whenever we're around each other. We can have a, a very intellectual conversation together, or we can just laugh our asses off about stupid shit. We can just, uh, it could be anything. Completely random. Or even if John Matt doesn't know what to say, he'll just start laughing. Robbie was making a, uh, made a conversation or made the comment that he just loved John Matt's laugh when he got to a certain point. Like, I don't remember how you mimicked it now, Robbie, but. Like you're still on well, mute. He, he'd sound like a little kid. And you know when you tickle someone and then it's like, <laughs> and they get to that point. That's the way John would get. And if you can get John laughing, he would kind of have that clown, like really like belly giggle laugh if he was laughing really hard. And, and if me and Ben saw that, it was like, it was like a lion looking at prey. We were like, oh yeah, we're salivating. We're going to keep going and see if we can make him choke to death. Uh, you know, just, just laughing so hard. So yeah, we, we would do that. Uh, ben in the chat, uh, Anita Sanders asked, how far apart in age are the three of you? Seems your brother is much older. Now, uh, I, you know, Anita, we're, we're actually 11 years apart. Um, so John uh, just turned 48 uh, this last um, summer. And then me and Ben are about to turn 37 here in November. So just 11 years apart. I can't imagine what 11-year-old John thought. Chris, cousin Chris might remember because they were around the same age. Uh, and maybe Ray and Judy and others about John Matt's reaction. I'd love to know from anybody that knew him. Well, what was his reaction when me and Ben are coming along? You find out you're going to have two twin brothers that's going to steal all the attention and everything that's going to come in. I, I can't imagine an 11 year old boy will take that too kindly when we come into the picture. Yeah, we, we always ben, heard me and that. Ben are ahead, 11 bro. years older than his. That's a weird thing. Is we're 11 years older than his uh, first son, too. So Jacob is 26. Uh, as well. So it's, it's kind of unique how that all worked out. And then I'm yeah. 11 minutes older than Ben. That's what I was getting ready to say. That's the weird thing is uh, he's 11 years older than us. We're 11 years older than Jacob. And me and Robbie's 11 minutes apart the way we were born. So it's there's something weird about that that number and all. But, the, you know, since you saw that, Robin, we're, we're trying to keep an eye on the chat. I think this is a good moment to answer a question or two that's on there and also just go back and mention some comments. I wanted to stay on there just because he means so much to us. Uh, Mike McClinic, who is uh, also our coach, John Matz as well. So we still call him coach, but he did comment earlier and he said he just wanted to say how proud of you guys that we are for John Matt uh, that have been a lot to us. I actually wanted to read uh, one of the comments he said, and this was something that I didn't ask him to do. Uh, he said that he was uh, sorry and that you're all in my thoughts and prayers. And this was one of the comments he had given us, but he actually said that I could give a, a quote that he was trying to help out, that it was a, that John Matt was a special young man to coach and he was such a hard worker and a great teammate and very coachable, loved having him in school and on the team. That was a message, a quote directly from Coach Mike McClinic. We all use that notice uh, and we love Coach and, and he's been very supportive in this process. I still remember, and, and Coach, I know you're still watching live. I have to say, I still remember that conversation you had and whenever I had to break the news to you about John Matt, uh, that was like devastating to me. And 
because uh, I know it just hit you so hard. Uh, and again, yeah, this is someone that, you know, I'm, I'm saying the people that don't know coaches, how much they'll look up to him, but his reaction to having to tell uh, him that John Mab was in the nursing home and the stroke and all that, it hit him hard. And like I said, coach had a stroke uh, himself before. So it's, it was tragic, but, uh, but he was one of them that commented, Anita, you had that question a while ago. She had a comment earlier that she said, hey, I have learned so much about your older brother during your sad time. You're both awesome. John Kleeman is one of his best friends. Uh, probably his major best friend, at least over the years. I know he's just like a we, – we consider him like family. He's, you know, he's catching the show tonight. Uh, Tiffany Rose, she said she just wanted to say that you and your family have been in my prayers and thoughts through this difficult time. Um, we also had Jennifer Crabtree. She says, I was so sad to hear about the loss of your brother. My thoughts and prayers are with you all during this very trying time. And then, of course, our, our, our friend Matthew Poe, Robbie, I, I can't remember now. I think you've gotten to meet him in person. I'm not sure. Yeah, I was able to meet him at Hoosier Hysteria. Um, I think it was two yeah. years ago. But anyways, he, he was on here. He had, a, he had a question or that he had put on here. He said, Ben and Robbie, have you guys found yourselves leaning more on your loved ones, becoming closer to them, especially Robbie with you and your girlfriend? Robbie, did you want to answer that first? Yeah, I mean, th this is kind of ironic because I was just I, I just texted uh, – Caleb last night before John had passed earlier in the morning is that, uh, you know, Letha was with me. We had just moved in together just a couple of weeks ago and, and things are obviously going well. We're both teachers, um, you know, and uh, so whenever we were going up there, Benny, you know, I went up to, of course, that first day alone, but, you know, yesterday was very tough. Uh, it was just me and you and Letha and Caleb uh, that were there for the most part. Mom was there and your, your wife, Ashley was there for, a while there in the morning, you drove them back. But whenever things started to get closer to the time of the procedure, you know, Caleb made up his mind that he wanted to be there for the hero walk. And here, here's my girlfriend and, and Caleb, my nephew that I've known forever. And like, this is the first time they meet. And here's Letha. She's the only one with Caleb. So, of course, it's, it's difficult on Caleb to see his father like that, to see me and you. And I, 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 I tapped Caleb on the shoulder uh, as we walked by. And I, and I think that was hard on him. And the fact that Letha, you know, she was there with him. She, she said that for the three or four hours we were doing the OR stuff, her and Caleb basically opened up just a huge can of worms. Like she just told Caleb, even some of the, the, the darker things that happened to her that really shaped who she was. And I think that made Caleb more comfortable to share with her. So Ben, to answer Matt's question, I feel like Ben, you and Letha's already got along. We've took a trip to Bloomington together. Uh, we, you know, we've gone up there and stuff, but just over the last couple of days, just, you know, this is, not, this is just one example. I'm saying, you know, my, my girlfriend, I can tell, has already developed more of a bond with Ben and, and my nephew now. And that's something that my nephew won't forget talking to Letha that way, no matter how far in the future or, or Ben that way. Um, and, and again, me and Ben, this has brought us closer again together too. It's not that any, any of us wants something like this to happen. But as Matthew, you know, this question comes up because I think this happens a lot to people is I think that tra tragedy will, will many times bring people closer together. It did in 2015 when this first happened. Um, you know, mom had her cancer scare and, and fought through cancer, and me, Ben, and John came together for that. We've, we've been involved. And, and, you know, there'll still be suffering ahead in the future. There'll be great times. There'll be sad times, but it brings us together. And then there's, like, really good times, like Jacob, his oldest son, and Kelsey's um, gender reveals coming up, I think, October 3rd. That's one of those – awesome moments that you know if there is such a thing after life you know John's going to be there in some way and, and see it if anything John probably knows already and he probably loves the fact that he has the secret and Kelsey and Jacob uh, don't know <laughs> on that or at least they're not revealing it to everybody else so it, it's, it's it's really great to hear that I, I would love to toss it over to you Ben I mean I'm just that's just from the two days that I was there and what I saw I uh, get to go out and talk to Caleb a little bit more get to sit talk to Kelsey and Jacob get even closer to Kelsey I'm trying to really dip Kelsey and the, and the twin brother Malcolmson vat of what it's really like to spend an extended amount of time with me and Ben. I told her in the elevator that by the end of all of this uh, year, Kelsey's going to be like, Ben and Robbie are never babysitting. <laughs> our, our son or daughter <laughs> tends to be uh, that's on there. But we, we like to really initiate people and see how they can handle our humor. But for me, Ben, I definitely, that, that hits deep because I, of course, I asked Caleb last night, hey, I really like this. This woman, I see something really long potential there. What, what do you? What did you think of being there today and everything? And Caleb, of course, Caleb being as modest as he always is, he's like, "I'm happy if you're happy," and he's all supportive of that. And it was just cool to hear him do that. 
and, and just to, to even develop a closer bond. Um, of course, we didn't want that over a loss, but you're never going to forget a moment like this. And, uh, and that did work. And obviously being there this morning, this is the darker part. I think it'll be okay to talk about it just because, you know, everybody and so much of the family was there. And something told me last night, this Leith and I were like, we're not driving back by Bowling Green again. Um, we're going to stay in the room. And we went up to the hospice room. It's just that whole floor is just super quiet because it's all about the hospice stuff. They didn't even have John Matt hooked up to any more machines other than just the little IV thing. And it's just, I had him turn the lights off. I kept one light in the, in the distance on. I had him turn them on his side a little bit so he could breathe a little bit easier. And it's just, as every 30 minutes went by, every hour went by, his breathing just kind of went slower and slower and smaller and smaller. And we, we fell asleep, but we wake up often. And Letha woke me up about 5.45, and she's just like, he, he's, he's starting to stop breathing a little bit. I quickly sit over to the chair next to him and started to put my boots on, and I, and I was there. I, I was able to, to see my brother, and I saw him take his last few breaths. And, Ke- and Letha and I just standing there together. And that's something that you're not going to be able to take that away. Like, Letha and I – I was honored to be there and to witness that. And I know that would scare a lot of people and maybe that might not be appropriate for some listeners on here to hear, but to, to be there, I, I felt relief in that moment and to walk out there and, and to, to see my brother, uh, you know, had passed on. Uh, I was able to call Ben and Ben, it was like meant to be, you were actually up and it never happens, but you were <laughs> actually light, awake light of all times. Overslept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ben, and it was meant to be because someone needed to really sit with mom and calmly talk to her. I didn't want her to find out on the phone, even from her son. So Ben was able to quickly put his shoes on. He went over and sat and calmly told her. And as John Clement and I talked today, we, we've had to kind of prepare at least three times over the last five years that we thought John was going to pass away. And it, and that never gets easier or anything like that. But I think that, like you said earlier, Ben, we knew this kind of thing was going to come. But to just sleep in there last night, it, it's the weirdest thing because the room just felt – oddly very calm uh, very uncomfortable sleeping in there but it was just really calm in the environment and I just I just had this feeling that at some point soon he was going to and the oxygen level and the heart rate just kind of slowly just kept sliding down uh, as the night went but he never struggled it was extremely calm uh, he had you know plenty of morphine things like that it, it was to be honest with you Ben because Ben knows because he was there we both saw saw our father we were standing around the recliner when our father did the same thing and, our, and John met passed away almost identically the way our father did. It was just like a, a calm, kind of just slow, like release of breath. And it was just like a quietness and there was just no moving. And to be honest with you, the emotional part was actually, we knew how much pain he had gone through. The people at the nursing home that have bravely worked with him and have done so much, and we should have been there more often through the nursing home stuff. They know how much nerve damage pain he had and how much frustration, how much uncomfortable pain he did. And to know that finally, he will never have to feel that pain again. That body that hindered him and that was crippled, he is finally gone from that. And I think that's why I haven't even really cried yet. I've had moments where I broke down like, like Ben kind of did earlier, but it's still there. Like I know at some point it's going to hit me, but right now it's just way too much of a relief and knowing that he never has to feel like that again. He's not down here in the muck with the rest of us in the world that we're in. Like he, he actually gets to be somewhere much better. And that's, that's to me. And I know that's a long way of answering Matthew's question, but it definitely brought all of us closer together. Going over to you, Ben, did you have, from your perspective of your experience, do you think it brought us all closer together? And what effect do you think that that had from your point of view? I think it. I think it did. And just to tie that last part to what Robbie was saying, uh, and I can correct me if I'm wrong, right? But I think he. I was the first one that he contacted after John Matt passed away. So I, I happened to already be. And I said I had set alarm. I slept the best I had slept in three days last night, and I woke up at like four four thirty in the morning. And for those that have been keeping on the Facebook, it was kind of strange because I I had just made that Facebook post, which was another long one. And I was saying something about in time, in time, you know, obviously the donation, didn't, donor thing didn't work out, but in time, John was going to, going to pass and we're going to move on. And then it wasn't too long after that, Robbie's calling me and, and then he, he's breaking the news to me that he, he's, he's passed away. And, uh, and again, I just, I felt, I'm, I'm just going to say, cause Robbie has been such a huge reason why I've been able to hold it together the last couple of days, especially because I've been a fucking mess uh in the last couple of days and and I'm, i apologize for the language if there's any children watching but there but i i just been i was a wreck i mean it's like i i whenever the, everything went south as uh, with the donor thing that just 
I felt defeated after the the donor the donor thing didn't work out just because I wanted it. So, and that was the main thing that upset me. And my wife would attest to this. Is she was the first person I called that, and I was doing fine through the whole conversation until I described to her that the donor process got canceled, and I just lost it. I was like, I had to let her go. And uh, you know, Robbie, you know, like I said, that tied to the the, the post about how we were in the OR together, and our or we were determined to finish it out with him, and I could not finish it. Robbie did, but I could not say him. I, like, I literally got to the point where I almost blacked out on the floor, and I didn't want to make a scene, so I, I, I literally walked out, and I just couldn't get back in there because, I, uh, ironically enough, Robbie would like this. Is, I, I, I had gone out and kind of, uh, kind of sat against the wall, and then when I felt better later on, I was going to go back in, but when I went to put my suit back on, I realized I blew the fucking crotch out and the ass in my suit so i had to take we were joking about that we the nurse and us we had an hour and a half of waiting because for some reason the declaring doctor just left the hospital so they had to like scramble to find somebody and i just pictured ben when we were putting those like exterminator suits on and i, I felt so bad for madeline the nurse she was stuck in there with this and here's me and ben like a couple of clowns just like tripping over each other and acting like we're gonna punch each other and stuff just trying to do anything to ease the tension a little bit and to be honest with you ben making me laugh so much uh, in there and Madeline, everything, the nurse, I think that really helped me a lot. Cause when I got into the OR, I, I, for some reason I felt calm. I didn't, I usually, I'm the one that's like Ben that has to kind of step away there or anything, but for some reason I just felt calm. But in Ben's defense, he's been the main one. It's not that, uh, you know, he didn't want us to help, but Ben's been the main one posting on social media. Everybody's asking Ben questions. Everybody's questioning him. And Ben, you've been so strong over those days. I think once the donor thing, once we got in that situation and we could, we could hear things that we didn't think that we may hear in that situation. I think it just shook your body. Like it, rationally, you wanted to be there, but your body just, it wasn't ready for that kind of a culture shock. And then, you know, in another way, it was nice because then Caleb and Letha got to come down and stay with you and be in there. But it, it was ironic because we were making jokes that I know John Mad, if he was like hovering over that room and watching us, he had to be cracking up at, just yeah. some of the things that we were doing and stumbling around with in that room. No, I, just a, the best way I can sum up uh, Matt's question, because I know me and Robbie were going all the way around. That's just the Malcolmson thing. We're going to take the long scenic route to get to that response. And, uh, but we, we, uh, uh, but yes, Matt, it, it did bring the family closer together. But the best thing I can say is over the six years, it's no different this time. Uh, even though there was, there was some of us that were physically there and there's some of us that couldn't, uh, there, it was a unified effort. Robbie's giving me way too much credit on that part because if it wasn't for, and I want to call him out by name because, and I'm sorry if I leave anybody out, but like me, Robbie, Caleb, uh, Michelle, Jacob, Becky, uh, mom, we were all there physically in some way or capacity here and there. But then like behind the scenes, like our Aunt Judy, our Uncle Mike, our, our cousin Laura, or, or Chris and Grant and and Gretchen and all them and what they were doing, our friends and family, the the city of Calton, Chris Corley, uh, Julia Hoover and the Hoover family, like everybody was doing all these working things behind the scenes that was trying to either help us with John or they're trying to get some things taken care of so we didn't have to worry about that or mom didn't have to worry. It was a unified effort is my long answer, but not only did it bring the family closer together again, Matt, uh, it, it, it actually brought like us, our friends closer together. It felt like they slowly and slowly kept on becoming more like family to us. So it, it really meant a lot. I think that's the best thing. But I do want to I want to transition real quick to Kathy because she did have some comments she wanted to throw in. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, the past couple of days I've spoken to both of you in little snippets and, and heard pieces of the story and just listening to it tonight, um, I'm just so impressed. Um, you know, I think that when it came down to it, everyone really banded together. I always say that during our, you know, fan, you know, teammate episodes, I always say, you know, I'm so jealous of your friendships that you've had them forever. And I think your family story here and the close friends, it, it's the exact same thing. I mean, everyone really banded together. I think that's a testament to your family, your friends, your community, but also John and just the legacy that he's leaving and the people that he impacted. And I think that's incredible. Um, the other thing I wanna say is just from hearing the story about where everyone was last night, I, I just had this eerie feeling that everyone was where they were supposed to be. Um, Robbie, you being there with Letha, um, mm -hmm. 
been, you know, you finally being able to get some sleep, but being able to go straight to mom the second that you heard the news and tell her in person, it, it just felt, feels right. Just kind of hearing like from an outsider's perspective that you all are where you were supposed to be. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy, for those thoughts. And, and we are getting ready to transition the story. I want to share a couple of comments real quick and then one more comment about mom. And then we will do the story, I promise. Talking Who's Your Baseball over on YouTube, our, our friends over there at IU Base, uh, their podcast platform, they said, so sorry for your loss, guys. Uh, I know that's like Chris Feeney and Josh Bennett and all those guys over there, Carl. Uh, we really appreciate your guys' support. The Indiana Who's Your Community, both our IU podcast family and the fans have all been so supportive. We got so many messages from people that said, you know, I don't even know you guys as people necessarily. I just followed IU stuff, but uh, just listening to the stories, I feel like I, I've known you my whole life or I feel like I know your brothers. So thanks. Uh, I, I, I also had some comments there that uh, Terry Watkins, she, she's a friend of me. I always refer to her as Mama Hoosier. We've been close over the years. She said, call me when you're ready to publish. I would do it for you. She's talking about the book comment we made earlier. Uh, and she's, and, uh, and I know Terry, she's not bullshitting either. Like she, she means that. Uh, so thank you, Mama Hoosier. And then lastly, Derek Llewellyn, uh, who's another close associate or a friend of uh, John Matt's. And he's also the, the police of uh, Tell City chief of police. He said, John Matt has been a personal mentor. He always spoke about his family with such pride. So uh, thank you, Derek, for providing. And again, just to reiterate, if anybody wants to comment or ask any questions in the YouTube chat, we will keep trying to check on that. We really appreciate the support tonight. I've seen it over 70 people in here live, and we've never come close to touching that, that amount on here. So it just means a lot. It tells us that there's so many people that, that think of John Matt. But lastly, just before we tell this story, there's been the most common question, and rightly so, we want this to be the case. A lot of questions about mom. And, and Robbie, before we tell the story, I'll give you a chance to comment on this too, because people want to know how mom's doing. And I, I really appreciate that. I want to say that she is doing considerably well, or she is doing very well considering everything. Uh, just to describe, like Robbie made the phone call to me. Uh, I call, I contacted Judy, uh, our Aunt Judy first, and also let her know that uh, of his passing. And then I, Robbie gave, I we physically went over there to tell her. So I, you know, I had to wake her up, and and sit her down on the couch. And of course, you know, again, I've mentioned on Facebook that people people need to know that mom has challenges with hearing. It's just because if you're going to talk to her, you got to understand that. So, you know, so I, you know, we calmly like I explained it to her, and mom just kind of like. You know, she sat back in the chair and she took a big, you know, side leaf and she was just kind of staring off in the left room. But you can tell she was just like trying to process the fact that this isn't, it, it's, it's over and it's, it's really happened. And I could feel like it really, it's just like the best, the, the best way to describe that whole thing is just the, the word finally. And it doesn't mean that in a bad way, but Robbie said that John Matt had this feeling he gave off whenever he he let go for the last time like finally it, it's over when Robbie said to me on the phone I started crying and I said finally that his suffering and then at the same time when I tell mom she says it organically but but she just like her main thing was just wanting to know that John Matt didn't suffer and he didn't Robbie and them said and then even Letha uh, also said that it was as peaceful as you can imagine it to be he just he just like slipped off and that was the end of it so uh, but mom did handle it really well. Uh, she was there with us making funeral arrangements today, doing, doing well considering. And I would tell you, if you guys want to call her, if anybody wants to contact her, uh, if she doesn't recognize your number, she might not answer right away. But I will, I will provide that number for you. It is Her number is 812-547-7564 if you want to just call her. And feel free to leave her a voicemail. I mean, yeah, she'll, yeah. she'll listen to it. And Ben, just to add to that, yeah. just to take Ben's advice the other day, if she has her hearing aids in, she will tell you it's hard to hear. But if you remind her to take her phone and move it to the left ear, because I know her habit is always holding the right hand, it's like she can hear much better from the left ear than that. And this is one of those things, I know we got to wear a mask, but if you speak to her at the funeral home or outside or something like that, sometimes I'll just slide my mask down and talk to her because she also is like has become like an expert lip reader like she'll listen to but she'll watch your lips too and i know that the coronavirus stuff it's made it even more difficult to really communicate that so just be cognizant of that going forward too thank yeah. you uh, absolutely so I, i'm not telling anybody to take their mask off but it, it's really important for people to know that if you go to the funeral home uh and you you are trying to interact with mom uh, like i said she is very used to kind of depending on on seeing your lips and your mouth move because 
the, another thing to give you a tip is you want to talk like slowly and concisely with her. And sometimes it helps you just kind of keep it short. And I know that's one of the things too, is we want to, we want to tell stories and talk to mom and have these people, but there's another reason too, like they want to, you got to kind of have to keep that thing kind of going because there might get to the point where people are literally waiting outside to get in there because of COVID. So uh, we got to kind of have like a kind of efficiency to, I guess. But anyways, mom is doing well considering that I, I really wish I could, it's one of these times where I like, I really wish she was Facebook savvy so she could see the things. But at the same time, it scares the shit out of me to imagine her having Facebook because she'd be writing on me and Robbie's Facebook walls. You know, she would mm -hmm. be saying, you know, don't forget to wear a jacket. It's, mm -hmm. it's 69 degrees outside. Yeah. Like that. We need to get her a jitterbug. We've been wanting to get her a jitterbug for a while and walk her through that for a day. Just keep making her do it over and over again. But no, I mean, she, she's doing really well, but we really appreciate, I mean, doing yeah. really well considering we really appreciate the support from mom and please keep it coming because like i said that, that that's my biggest worry and robbie's biggest worry in the families is you, you know for you all of you out there that have children uh and i don't have children myself and robbie doesn't it, it's just the, the worst thing i think you can imagine is having to bury your own child and uh and i that makes me that hurts me more for mom just because she has to uh do that i mean it's hard enough with like you know dad not being here but obviously it's just how it's meant to be the the world is raw and real and you can't there's things you just can't control and unfortunately you know mom's gonna have to bear through this and i can only imagine what that's like for all of you that have a child or that has had children that you've had to had to bury like we've known people over a course of our life robbie like like edie's country kitchen and couch and i uh, heard the grandma we always referred to her as grandma she had to bury every one of her kids before she died so i couldn't imagine that that's our biggest worry there's just Showing that support for mom, letting her know. Her biggest worry right now is, a, is a, you know, people aren't going to know when the funeral is going to be because uh, we tried to explain to her that she, she doesn't understand how Facebook and all that works. She's like, you know, uh, I can't even remember what she offered now, but we, we were like, trust me, people are going to know. Uh, we're going to yeah. make sure. So if you decide to show up, if, if you're worried about anything, if there's any inkling of you wanting to go, if it's just, to, just for mom to see your face, even if it's saying hi across the room or something or to give her a hug, that would mean the world to her. And, but just like already just virtually knowing you all here, it means the world to us. So hopefully later on we can show them on this, but I want to go yeah. ahead. I'm going to check the YouTube thing real quick, just to make yeah, sure. I was gonna say, ben, I think we have a few comments we can look through. Derek Llewellyn had a really good yeah, one. Michael I, I, actually, all yeah, the way I, just, down. I just shared that one with Derek. Okay. That's the one that he had. So again, if anybody else, any comments, I'm going to go ahead and, we're going to transition to the story that I want to well, share. Well, Ben, we have uh, Coach McClinic put a really great comment at the very end. He said, I'm going to talk to my team, and we're going to dedicate the season to John Matt. So that is a wonderful honor that Coach is going to do okay. that. Well, I don't – I must not – something's weird with that because I cannot see that message. I don't know where you're seeing that. Is that below Derek Lowndes' comment? No, it's below it. I mean, if you scroll all the way down by my comments, um, Anita um, – Sanders asked a justified question. For okay, those of you that don't do the chat, she said, why didn't the donor thing work out? And just for those of you that don't do the chat, I said there's a, 30, a strict 90-minute time limit because the logistics that go into that, just like in like TV shows and movies, it's so strictly planned out. And there's so many people waiting on the other end. There has to be like helicopter transport. And if there's any delay after that 90 minutes, that there's too much of a risk of the integrity of the organs and their physical nature or other things going awry. And it happens um, rarely, but it did happen last night. It just wasn't meant to be. And it was, it was sad. But um, like Kathy said earlier, it seemed as though everybody ended up in the right place at the right time for that to happen. And we still hope that those – patients that were supposed to receive um, any potential organs will, will receive that in the future from someone. But it, it was a difficult situation. Um, but like I said, Ben, you, you might have to refresh the page sometimes too, Ben. Okay, I, I got it now. My, my filter was set on top comments for some reason instead okay. of live chat. So now I can see. But yeah, so you can start to right there, now. There, there, well, there's a, there's several comments that I wanted to make sure people get because okay, this tied okay. into the conversation about the getting closer in Letha. It's Letha Shoulders in the chat, which is Robbie's girlfriend. She had said it meant the world to me to just be there with all of you. So uh, I think I, I think it that was a huge thing because Letha, I mean, she saw like 
like the way I say in that one post that family sees it all, like she saw it all and she didn't run away. So that's one of the things that I, I think is meaningful. Micah Jackson made a comment, said I worked some shifts with him in Candleton. Great man, enjoyed many laughs with him. Prayers to your family. Brian Tonsoni, Coach Tonsoni, he said, sorry, I'm late, guys. Been thinking of you all day. Coach, we really appreciate your support. He's been sending us a lot of, of messages and, and very appreciative. Uh, Iman, our good friend. Iman, I have to say that while we're on here. I always used to say yeah. that. Is, uh, yeah. She said, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. My thoughts and prayers are with you and your family, especially Mama Malcolmson. Please give her a big hug for me. And Nicole Harris, which is our which our, our best friend, Eric Harris, it's his uh, niece as well. Uh, Nicole had said, so sorry for your guys' loss. Uh, and then, of course, Mike McClendon's comment that he was going to talk to my team and dedicate this season to John Matt. I'll just reiterate that one again. So, again, if anybody else has comments, you know, I got that actually uh, put on there. Or any questions, too. Like I said, so, yeah, the, the organ donation thing, it's a tricky process. And uh, at least from what I understand is if they, they, they had all these things, it's not like they can just flip a switch and be ready. They had all these things that organized. This crew came down. They had to fly in. Uh, and, and to get there so they can't just hang around there for days on end waiting on the process so if he were to be a move and then pass away I don't think uh, timing's also an issue I don't think they could logistically and all that get prepped and everything in order for his organs and stuff to still be worth quality uh, enough to, to help somebody so it's just how it worked out unfortunately but anyways uh, again any comments uh, or questions feel free to put that in there other than that Robbie I'm going to transition to the story so lastly before I say this again this is a very raw uh, but it's it's a very true story and and I and I've made this uh, people have read it on Facebook I originally wrote it in the sense of my perspective, but now it's been reworded to where it is me and Robbie telling the story. But yes, we both equally shared these emotions and experiences because, you know, we're twins. We tell each other everything or we feel the same things. So uh, it's definitely on here. Uh, but like I said, lastly, this is something that we're sharing during the service. Uh, and, and this is going to be our message. So you're going to hear the exact way that we're going to read it at the service. So again, if you're there, you're going to hear it again later on. So, uh, but this is going to be a special, this is our way to honor him. So again, I'm going to go ahead and start it off the way I would if I'm visually standing in front of like that podium at the, at the funeral home. So a brief pause and then I'll kind of go into it. All right. <clears throat> it's called the tragic tale of John Malcolmson. We would like to start this by thanking each and every one for their continued love and support for both our older brother, John Malcolmson, and our family during this difficult time. In saying that, we wanted to do something to honor our brother. The best way we can do that is through something raw and real. A story of truth, a story with heart, a story about his life, in a nutshell anyways. A story that if you do not read or listen all the way through, you will never fully appreciate. See, each of our lives are like a book filled with different chapters. John had many, yet at the same time, not enough. Our stories start before we were even born, raised and nurtured until you were out of the womb and into the world. My parents created life. Their firstborn, our older brother, John. Soon, he will leave this world still in his 40s. In saying that, there were so many chapters that led up to this moment that need to be shared. Our early beginnings start with our childhood. As he grew older, he would become the brother to Robbie and myself. Two little surprises popped out of nowhere. Two little hellraisers. Our earliest memories are of John being that older brother who we looked up to. He would come home from school and every day he was determined to spar with Ben and I. It would start playful and end in one of us submitting to an excruciating grapple. Hold on, hold only for him to pick us up, dust us off and say, oh, quit crying, you're all right. Then it was getting ready for the next day and the next round. The story started and ended the same. We look back on it as, as, as us spending time together. We did not dread it. We welcomed it. The terrible two met their match day in and day out. And it was by the hands of our own flesh and blood. Who better to kick our asses straight, right? I mean, Mama Malcolmson can't do it all the time. She needed a break from those duties from time to time. 
As he grew older into his teens and to his early 20s, it was filled with good times and dark times. Was that really anything too out of the ordinary for any of us? We were all trying to find our way during those chapters in our lives. We all face our own demons through those years. John definitely faced his. What came of it was him persevering through another battle in the War of Depression. He would go on to get involved in the medical field and become a paramedic where he would help save lives. What other great honor could you have, have been rescuing so another? He lived for it. He loved it. He was good at it. He became admired and respected for his efforts, his intellect, and his professionalism. Ben and I found that inspiring. Although we did not want to enter the medical field, it motivated us to make the most of whatever opportunity we would turn to. I believe John had goals and ambitions. He was going to go after it 110% committed, witnessing that only better to us for our futures. As the chapters in his life continued, he would go on to become a husband, a father, and a mentor of others. He experienced different career paths and leadership roles throughout his opportunity, each one bringing their own set of challenges. He was living a pretty damn good life, you could say. Not everyone is as fortunate. Much like his early chapters, it was mixed with its share of dark times, bad decisions, and regrets. This is not to overshadow the important and positive differences he made. This is being open and honest with what we all deal with through our book of life. I remember John telling me when he was a reserve cop, when dealing with people who break the law, he said, most of these people are not bad people. They just make a bad decision. That always stuck with me. Our older brother became part of a long list of Malcolmson family members who suited up and went to war day in and day out with our greatest enemy, ourselves. There has never been, nor ever will be a greater foe. Much like any war, battles are won and lost. Ben and I both have felt the taste of victory and the sting of defeat throughout our lives up to this point. John was no different. The biggest takeaway we have with our older brother is looking back on the good, the bad, and the beautiful, and coming to terms with whether our brother's book of life would be a tragic tale. One without a happy ending. One where his own struggles would get the best of him before he could realize it and right the ship before it was too late. With John, it would become too little too late in certain circumstances. Much like brothers are, you will come to sparring with each other. Only a moment as adults was far different than it was wrestling around in the living room playfully. Now, it was raw and uncut. Now, as grown men, it was real. We would go to war with him over responsibilities, priorities, money, family, and just about any other category that you could think of. At times, we couldn't have been more far apart from one another, like a wedge driven deep between each other when passion and pride would go toe to toe. The beautiful part is we would grow closer together in the most crucial of times when we really needed to the most. We butted heads often, but when push came to shove, we would find a way to meet again and again. Dad's cancer and passing. John's own health struggles over the six-year span. 
And mom's cancer fight for all examples of standing together for a greater purpose other than ourselves and our wants and needs for one another. We were no longer against each other. We, were, we banded together for a common cause. To show love and bond outlast any storm. These last couple of days have given us a different mindset. Would we still describe John's book of life as a tragic tale? The answer is no. Why, you ask? His story had the potential to end just as great and significant as it started. A chance to save lives again, much like he did in his prime chapters of his life by being an organ donor. Although it was not to be, John's desire was there to help someone who needed a liver, a kidney, a lung. People that loved and disliked him, we see him for a however they will see him, but family. Family sees it all, the good, the bad, and the beautiful, imperfect perfections of his book. The stories only the family sees or hears, or wants you to see or hear. Despite all of it, nothing breaks the bond of family. We are only scratching the surface of the detailed pages of John's life. We close with telling you how we will remember John Malcolmson. If we could tell him one last thing before, before he draws his final breath, it is this. Have you ever wondered why we stood with you so loyal? Have you ever wondered why we stood against you so passionately when we thought you needed to be stood up against? It was because of you and how you had a hand in shaping us. You taught us how to have compassion for others. How to be kind. How to be pissed off. How to fight and know, and know how to know when to back down. You taught us what it meant to stand up for what was right. Even if it meant against our very own flesh and blood. You taught us dedication. You taught us to have pride in our careers, our lives, and our friends. You taught us trauma, pain, addiction, and suffering. You taught us that giving up or giving in was never the answer. You taught us how to live. And for that, we cannot thank you enough. We loved you tough. You taught us that. That love will never waver. We do not stand against you. We forever stand with you. So this is not a tragic tale of John Malcolmson. This is a tale of someone that cared for others and was cared for. Someone who is not just another statistic. Someone who fought just as many battles against the darkness in this everyday world as the darkness within himself. When the moment came for you to go, I was there with you until the end. You looked into the sky and took that final breath. A peaceful release. No more pain. No more suffering. At 5.45 a.m. Monday, September 21st, 
2020, you left this world. Even in death, you will leave a lasting imprint on us and many others. John would not expect us to give up or to give in. Time for us to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off. As John would put it, oh, quit crying. You'll be all right. We will be, John, because of you. His book of life, what a raw, real, and beautiful tale. This is how we will remember our brother, John Malcolmson. Thank you. Thank you. I think I kind of need to break for a second. Uh, not that I had to leave, but Kathy, I know you had to sit there for a while listening to me and Robbie tonight. Is there anything that you want to? She's probably just impressed comments. that we could talk slowly if we need to, or at least as slow <laughs> as we can. Well, I, I am impressed, but I'm impressed for many, many, many reasons. Um, that was raw, beautiful, and real. And I think just listening to it, I, I, I felt like I was going through the journey of John's life with you both. Um, it was just really well written. It was beautiful. It was real. Um, and I think it also had the power to kind of make everyone who was listening in reflect on their journey through life and the people that are along it with them. Um, I, I just, I, I know I'm still processing it because it's so powerful. I had read it online, um, but I am so, so glad and appreciative that you both shared that tonight and read that for everyone because it was super raw. I loved going through the journey with you all. And I, I just, I don't have enough words to just say how grateful I am to you both for sharing. Thank you, Kathy. That, that really means a lot to us. And and that's really, like I said, that's that's exactly, I do need to make an edit there. I know I had mentioned earlier on it, within the uh, the conversation that SUNY was going to pass away. Obviously, that's already happened. So that's, a, that's something that will be revised later on. So it's okay, though, on because everybody uh, knows that when you wrote that, though, you know, we're reading something, you could preface it by saying, you know, we wrote this before he passed. And this is kind of, this is our state of mind. And I don't think that you need to necessarily change the metaphysical state of the language, Ben, because that, that was who you were in that moment that you wrote it. Like, uh, and, and that, that's as long as people understand the context of when that was written before the death, I think it, it makes it powerful because it's not just looking back in retrospect after he's gone. We knew that he was going to pass. And I think that's another attribute about your story that makes it powerful. Yeah. Really well said. Well, I, I think some of the other things is I, I'd like to do some uh, share, share screen stuff. I know we, we've been sharing different stories. I wish I had more funny stories I can share right now, but I think it's just bouncing back and forth between different emotions. It's hard to, to recall just one in specific. But like I said, we, we mentioned there about wrestling around the living room as kids with John Madden. He, I just remember he would get us in like a pinky finger submission hold. And just the pinky finger, it sounds like ridiculous, yeah. but it's Well, I think real. him and it's John Cleman, I think all those guys were taught that with the police thing on how to subdue people. And he'd grab that pinky finger and push it down. <laughs> we'd squeal. This is terrible. And I actually think he would still do that whenever we were still in our in our teenage years by then too. <laughs> you know, he'd just yeah. do it to like fuck the with funny. The, the funny but thing it, is though, Ben. Like I think just to kind of be light after he had his um, the aortic dissection, he was in bed just to try to get him laughing. One day, me and you walked up and like leaned over the bed, being who we are now, like six foot six to six foot eight, two hundred and forty pounds. And I like leaned over. I was like. Who's bigger now? <laughs> I was like, you want to try? I think that one day, one day he whispered that he could still beat our ass um, if he had to. And I was like, I was like, you know, all those times you did that, I should just beat your ass right down his bed. But we were just trying to get him to laugh and trying to do that. I think brothers do that. And if anybody can definitely empathize with that, it's probably Derek. I know Derek's in the chat. You, you grew up with brothers and, and, and a lot of males in the family and stuff. You, you had that experience. Yeah, really well said. I'm just checking back at the uh, the comments here. I just want to say, uh, uh, Kyra Christensen, she said, so beautiful, guys. The John Matt chapter in my book is full of friendship and love. 
Uh, Coach Sean Sony said, well done, fellas. We appreciate that. Uh, Late that mentioned, beautiful, very captivating, tear jerking. Uh, I know John Kleeman, you, you also coming back on it. He said, I'm so proud of you boys. Fantastic tribute. Love you both. We love you too, man. Like I said, I really I mean that biggest, I always tell him the biggest compliment we can give him is that he's, he's family. Uh, and he's still like a brother. He's like a big brother to me and Robbie. So, and then uh, Terry Walker said, you guys teach us all that love has no limits, good times and bad and life or death. And Derek, appreciate the comments. Well done. Pat Laney said, amazing tribute guys. Big dog would be so proud. Lots of love to all of you. And I remember now that they, yes, they would, they would call John Matt big dog too. So that's a, that's pretty funny. I'm saying, I'm saying, I have to say, I feel like that he created that nickname himself. It's like a picture of John saying, I want to be called big dog. It's like on you Seinfeld when George dog. wants to be called like, uh, what was it? The nickname that George wanted to be called in Seinfeld. Uh, he ended up getting Coco oh, the monkey as the nickname. Yeah, T Bone. I, I, I want to be called. You don't get to decide your own Coco. nickname. Coco. He's like, you're, you're Coco the monkey. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, if Eric was around, he'd appreciate that because we have over our Seinfeld course. But I, I think that, like, one of the other things is I'm going to throw it in share screen mode because there was, and, and again, it took me a little bit to get around to doing this because, again, after the news that happened uh, last night where the donor process didn't work out, but we had. Uh, Maddie, Madeline or Maddie, her name is, she is part of the donor group in the hospital. She was nice enough to, when we did that hero walk for John, and basically it's what they do for donor patients. When they're ready to go, the, the medical staff will line up down the hallway. And when they wheel the patient by, they do that to pay tribute to the patient because they know that person is going to go and save other lives. So it's like they're, they're passing away, but they have a chance to help others. So that's basically what was going on. And in the video, you can see me and Robbie. You can mainly just see me and Robbie's uh, asses <laughs> in the video. But I, I kind of prefer... You the mean you mean the lack thereof. The lack yeah, of... I guess I say... Not I mean, it's no Duncan Robinson ass, but I mean, you know, <laughs> Kathy. <Yeah. laughs> Kathy's over like, do our best. She's like, woo. Yeah. Uh, but, but anyways, uh, but it's kind of fitting because we didn't really want, uh, I didn't say anything about it, but I, I didn't really want people to have to see John too much there. But it, it was just kind of fitting that you can tell that he's being wheeled in front of us. And like the way we envisioned it, we walk with him through the whole process. Uh, so you, they, she follows us in the camera. So what you're going about to see, I'm, I'm probably going to kind of talk through it too, just because you don't really hear anybody talking. Everybody's just silent because you're like paying tribute. So I'm going to throw it in, in, in share screen mode here real quick and, and show you guys that. So again, this is the video here. I'm going to pop this up. Okay, I'm going to actually stop the share there real quick, but that that it didn't cut anything off there. But basically, they walked down the hallway, we took a right, and they were they were getting ready to to put him in the elevator to go to the floor where we needed to go. And then Robbie and I went into the next elevator with Maddie, and then we went up and, and the, the rest of the process started from there. So uh, just real quick, I'm going to check back at the comments because I'm sure we've had some more in there. I know Maria Harris. Yeah, people. Ben, I was going to say that the uh, the people don't, you can't tell in that video, but me and Ben were extremely anxious. Like right before we walked out of the room, he looked at me, he's like, I feel like I have a lot of anxiety right now. And I felt like our hearts were like kind of going, going crazy. Now we ended up going from that right there to about an hour and 15 minute wait uh, because of the situation that had gone on there. But like, uh, man, that, that was a, that was a meaningful moment, but man, on the inside, that was a, that was a hard journey. Uh, walking down because that felt like the green mile or something walking down it just felt like a really long uh, walk down that hallway but it helped to see Caleb and then see Letha off to the side and just that the fact that they did that meant a lot I, Ben I want you to read what Maria had posted she said some really yeah. nice things too yeah I want to make sure like again people are welcome to comment we want to try to and if we miss any of them, we apologize already in advance, but we'll try to keep track of all of them. And, and Robbie, Kathy, if you think you, you see any of this, say something. But anyways, to pick up where we left less on Pat Laney's message, she had uh, Maria Hare, who's known us for a long time, her family. Uh, I think she's remembered me and Robbie since we were little shits. So, uh, but she had some really nice comments. She said, uh, beautifully said, heartfelt or heartfully felt. 
much like your brother, you are helping others right now by sharing your story and naming and owning the range of emotions you are feeling during this grieving process. I mean, that's such a detailed feedback there. I love it, Maria. Uh, then Mike Melton commented, which I think that, you know, and it also had said Aunt Judy. So this is a message from Aunt Judy. She put with the hard, great job, boys. So that means a lot to me because it's just short and sweet because that was something that I'm really glad that, that, uh, that Aunt Judy could hear us cover that right now. So I, I think that it's special because you'll hear it a second time later on. Uh, but anyways, thank you, uh, Aunt Judy, and you and Uncle Mike. We love you guys and, and our extended family. But Maria Hare, she continued on by saying, I believe that your stories and tribute to your brother might help someone who, uh, who else is losing a loved one. Because when we tell our stories, we keep things real. We let others know they are not alone. And this unit saying John would be proud of you boys. So we really appreciate those comments, Maria and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, everybody else that was put on there. Rob, did you want to say something? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, Ben, that reminds me of something you shared with me twice is that you can get into like that tunnel vision and feel like the world's revolved around you sometimes. And you hear about families posting on Facebook and other social media outlets that they have a family member that's in critical condition or in terminal condition. And you, and you feel for that but that, that weight doesn't really hit you until it's your family. And Ben, you had mentioned one of your coworkers that works right with you, same, you know, similar job as you, you know, she has her father in the same situation that John is in where they're literally waiting from hour to hour if he's going to pass away. And, and that, that, that's, you know, it's very sad, but in another way, there's two people that can help one another and you could talk to her through that too. And it's, it's really difficult to even put into words but you know it's something that we're all going to experience someday. You hope that it's just going to be way beyond your perception and, and it, it's, it's going to take longer than it happens. But when it happens, you just wish that you had more time uh, and whatnot. But that's what I wanted to share, Ben. Yeah, it's really well said. Actually, I want to throw, I'm going to go to the next part now. We're, uh, we're, I know we're kind of winding down on what we're going to do this show, but I wanted to show a different variation of pictures or possibly video. I'm not sure if Becky would want me to share these videos or not because – not that one of them is really heartfelt because it's just, and I hope it's not like too graphic for some reason for people, but it's actually a photo of, or it's a video clip of John Matt whenever he was changing Adeline as a baby, but he's singing to her. He's like singing out loud and, and it's kind of heartfelt, but there's also another video that I haven't watched it yet, but there, there might be some language mixed in there. So apologies, you might want to close your your kids' ears or something, because I just want to play it for a little bit. If it seems like it's okay, I'll let it keep going. If it's not, I'll, I'll, I'll pause it. So I just want to, like, again, I said, I haven't watched these or looked at these yet. So whatever I'm about to show from Becky, one, this is to honor her and her family and share these memories that they had with him. And really, a lot of these photos are the first time that me and Robbie are seeing this and definitely Kathy. So again, I'm getting ready to throw it in share screen mode so you guys can see this. And we're going to go over to my best profile. These are the ones that Thank you, Simmons. So the first part is an actually video. I'm going to see if I can ex expand this. And the quality might not be great, but I have no idea what's getting ready to say. I could probably see Becky right now going, oh, my God. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens here. Like I said, if it gets too crazy, I'll always just pause it. But this is a video that you're going to see of John Matt. I definitely saw during the mute session. Hey, ben, real quick, yeah. uh, when, you, when you scroll over, I think the speaker might be muted on it. Go back over the picture. Oh, it uh, is. So I did that on purpose because I'm getting Okay, ready. okay. I just want to make sure. Anyways, the, the, this is audio, so if it's kind of loud, I apologize. But I just want to see what this because I've never watched this. So we'll, we'll see what happens here together. <laughs> Swing Caroline. I was going. I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> Can't get it to come on. <laughs> Imagine that Becky's having trouble with technology. <laughs> of course, he's singing Neil Diamond. Yeah, stricken with technology. But I'll pause that for a minute. It's a little good. But this is the other video clip I want to share. Uh, let, let me see if I could pause it real quick. This is the one uh, of him changing Adeline whenever she was a kid. So I'll just play this for a little bit because I think you can, you should be able to pick up the audio. I have seen this one before, so you can kind of hear. Uh, uh, John Matt kind of singing it, everybody. I just want to see if we can have this or not. Yeah. 
We're probably going to get hit with a music copyright. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. YouTube's going to ding us. Yeah. I would not be shocked to put it past YouTube. But I just wanted to show that just a little bit. Again, I think that's uh, that, that's okay and everything. I just didn't know if it, if it would show too much there. So I just, uh, but that was kind of special too, because I've completely, I've seen that a long time ago, like six years ago, I think Becky had showed me that. Uh, when we were in Louisville Hospital, and I thought that was touching. But these are a series of photos. I think it'll let me go through each one of them individually. But this is. And a I just wanted to reiterate, Ben. All these ones you're about to show here, I think most of them I've are going to be in the in the yeah. slideshow at the funeral too. Yeah. So I and again, I've I've never seen these photos yet. I haven't had a chance to look through the 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 messages that Becky had sent me. So we're all seeing these the first time. But this is a touching photo because this is on the beach. This is whenever Adeline was really little. And, you know, obviously John Matt's uh, hugging her. For those that don't know him real well, Adeline is John Matt's daughter. That's a, that's his actual blood daughter. He, he actually has, uh, you know, what we consider his stepdaughter and two stepsons, which would also be Adeline's brothers and sisters from, from another marriage. But but Adeline, you know, like that, that, that was his first. And John Matt, that was one of the things I can only say uh, is John Matt always, uh, he always wanted a daughter. And, and that was a, that was a big deal to him. So uh, again, I, I had to kind of go back in here real quick, just because just I kind of backed up too far. But these are just some different photos of him. So like, here's another one. Uh, I'm going to see if it just lets me scroll through all these. So, you know, and I'll, I might comment here and there on different things. But, and this is other pictures of Adeline. And them playing out in the snow. Here's a good one of the area back whenever we had the had the outfit on, uh, a photo of John Matt and, and Emma. This is the, the this is his, uh, his stepdaughter that I mentioned Emma, and this is whenever she was really young because she's really growing up a lot now too. So uh, and she's bas he's basically been in her life since she was two years old. Yeah, Probably I was gonna say I think Becky told us that you know she sees him a lot like a father figure too, and that doesn't take anything away from her biological father, but to be around someone since you're two, I can see why that you can be just as attached to an individual being around them that long. Here's another precious photo of them on, on the beach. Uh, and I always like this one here too. Again, this is Adeline and, and John. Uh, and this is a funny photo. This is, this is Austin and Logan. Uh, this is a, uh, this would be what, what it would have been like. They were still, I'm mean, obviously I know it's divorced now, but he'd still, to this day, I think he'd, he still treats them like kids. So this is technically uh, John's uh, stepsons. Uh, Austin and Logan's or, or half sons, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but he, it was really special having that because yeah, Ben, do you want to share like the, uh, another reason why I think Becky did that too, is the origin of that shirt for the people that, that didn't really know okay. back then what had happened. Uh, that shirt was a really meaningful thing too. Yeah. So, uh, let me see if I can kind of go back through these other ones real quick, just to show I was going to say that shirt we did for a fundraiser, like that's where that shirt came from. Yeah. And it had a Malcolmson Superman logo on it. This photo here was, I believe, they can correct me if I'm wrong, this is back when the aortic aneurysm thing happened, and he was kind of in that main stage of recovery now, but you can tell he's also doped up pretty significantly, I think, in this photo. But he's, he's also, like, I think this is the first time that Emma and them really got to see him from it all. So, uh, you know, this is a photo of them hugging each other. This is Emma, and you can tell there's a, there's a special connection, but a special moment shared there between, because Emma's like, reading a book or showing a book to John and, and he's enjoying it. And that's one of the things that sticks out to me right here is because uh, when John went to the nursing home for this, this massive stroke, uh, it was difficult, but there was a few times and in, in, even though there was a part of John that felt like was already gone, uh, he, there was times whenever you, he's really touching. And it makes me think of whenever I would do a video chat or something with Adeline or, or Emma uh, you know, I think there was at least the one time where Adeline was just, she was just had the phone propped up and she was just on the floor playing with her toys and John Matt was just watching her. And, and I was in the sitting in the room, just watching John Matt reaction. I couldn't see the phone, but the whole time John Matt's, you can tell it's like that part of him that was there went into like 110% focus mode. And he, 
His eyes were like wide open. He had a huge smile on his face and he was just living in the moment. Like he just loved watching Adelin just play. But of course, like with any high, there's a, there's a major drop off. So the, the hardest part for those conversations, whenever I would have to let them go. And, and then, so John would have that moment virtually with his, with his daughter or even physically, but then there's that, that parting of ways eventually. So the, then the, the reality would hit John Matt again and he would be, he'd be fighting back tears. And, and that, that was the hardest to see him cry because he, cause you can tell he knew, especially being in the medical world, he knew how, how, how like fucked he was in his situation. Sorry for the language, but he, he knew how serious it was. And, and he knew that he was never going to get a chance to, to, to be on the beach like that again and play in the water with her or, uh, or, you know, just playing out in the snow, like on some of these photos you see on here. And it was just like all came rushing back to him. And I honestly, and you know, what do you do in those moments? Like, I just remember just being there. I didn't say anything to him. I, I, I didn't go up to him and say, it's going to be okay. It was just one of those moments where you, you don't, you don't have to say anything. You just, just be there, you know, let, let him kind of, worked through the process himself. And I, so that was one of the most special moments I can remember from the nursing home experience. So again, these are a lot of different photos here of the different kids. I like this one of John and the dog. <laughs> so I thought you guys would like that one. That's an awesome yeah, one. Just share a few more of John, uh, all dressed up, all spiffy looking. Anyways, but it's kind of interesting because you go through these different photos. But uh, John also, again, these were, these were gave to me by Becky. This is a great photo. I'll, I'll actually stop on this one here just because uh, I'm going to transition yeah. close to the end here. Ben, so, do you mind if I sh if I share? Oh yeah, well, just no, before no, we go. Yeah, I just have a few, and then we'll we'll just to show a little bit more yeah, of. Exactly. Yeah, stop the share. You give, yeah, when you give it back to me, I'll I'll, I'll do it. And I'll give it. To change the host to Robbie, and then he's going to do share screen mode for you. Okay. So let me let me go into it. Okay, so you're seeing, and again, this is just a frall. A small fraction who can share. Yeah, all time. Okay, I'm just going to close that out. You can see like this is just a small fraction of some of the the photos that's going to be at the funeral. There's going to be at least 100, maybe a little bit over 100, and they wanted at least 60. Um, but I thought this was a cool one because he kind of did one of his speeches after everything happened. He said he did like a pseudo TED Talk. Like this looks exactly like a TED Talk. And I know that we've all seen those kind of things before. But like I said, this like these two pictures here, he loved being a public speaker. He loved sharing his his experience. And he said to me and Ben, it was very therapeutic to share that experience. So doing this episode here, and as sad as it was to go through what we've seen John go through and to share this with him, it, it is uncomfortable. I'm telling you that to hold stuff in all the time, it does not help that much either. But when you feel ready to start talking about something, it, it makes it makes it a lot better. And that was really therapeutic for him to do that. I thought, um, you know, this was the one for the main obituary picture, which we shows his uniform and I have his name tag, a part that he has in my show. I want to show this one um, based on all the pictures. I think this is one of the last pictures of John Matt before it happened. I know that, mm. however, if you see the trees, it's still cold weather here and whatnot, but this is his apartment. This is where the stroke happened his Jeep and everything here. I don't, this is one of the earliest, the latest pictures that he has on his Facebook. Um, I didn't find this one until tonight. I, th I thought that was a beautiful one of him and Emma there. Uh, I love this old school one of him and Jacob, Jacob having curly hair on his first point. Look at that stash. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm loving that, that stash and that awesome, like weird fall, like blanket in the background that instead of being seasonal, we just had that on the couch all the time, uh, that kind of thing. And then uh, now, I want to bring this up, Ben, because this has been the show. Dr. Pagney is incredible. Um, my ex-wife, like I said, her and I are still really close friends, but her uncle had heart surgery from this doctor as well. So John Matt and him both see Dr. Pagney as like a hero. And, and I don't know if Dr. Pagney knows yet what happened to John, but it's one of those things that we intend to show later on. Um, you do see a really good one of John Matt and Caleb here. You see little Caleb. Caleb is just like a a huge grown man now uh, going to Indiana University. We just show time goes by so fast. I had to show this one just to embarrass Jacob. Um, John Matt, like, forcing affection on his on son. And, and I think that was the time whenever he got to come and visit at the uh, air thing. And I think that um, mom did, too. One of my favorite pictures, and I don't know if it's on here. I don't think it's on this computer. But one of my favorite pictures that people will see is one of mom um, visiting where he worked at. And that was one of my favorite pictures. And then uh, the last two, this is where he came and spoke at my school. I was super happy that day to have him at my school all day. 
Um, and I met one of the other teachers. And then lastly, on Father's Day this last year, he had an awesome picture of our, our dad uh, with his awesome old school pants on. Our dad looking very tired <laughs> in the background. And then John, young John Ned, um, definitely a better looking kid than me and Ben. He still has that shot deer in the headlights, Malcolmson classic look on his face. Yeah, but, he, but he, I he thought it was have, a, he doesn't have the uh, dunking the basketball uh, nude photos that we had whenever we yeah. just, <laughs> for some reason we're just oh but I, I know yeah. but, but I, I wanted to share those I'll make you the host Ben because we're going to finish up but I, I just appreciate you allowing me to show a few of the things and we've given because some people in the chat are not going to be able to make it to the funeral home and and venture into Canton and stuff but Canton's town means a lot to us it's always still meant a lot to John Matt even though his life went somewhere else and uh I don't know. It's weird. Ben, whenever you brought that question up with Matthew Poe earlier, it made me think of that famous, like, uh, that saying where it says it takes a village to raise a child. But being a world history teacher and, and studying, like, old cultures, especially in Germany, it's weird because whenever an individual would die, when it would pass away on their deathbed, the village would also come together to mourn and help that individual. And they would celebrate the death and they would do the funeral together. It's like, you know, Counting is one of those small towns and areas that it doesn't matter whether you like people or you don't like people, a life is a life. And, and people have attachments to loved ones and, and dreams and hopes and aspirations. Whenever someone passes away, like I, I think, I wish we would revert to more of a, an old school kind of culture about celebrating life and, and, and celebrating and helping in, in death as well. And I think that's another way of meaningfully looking at it. But then I, I, you can go back to you, Ben, and kind of wrap things up. But I just, I, I love the fact that maybe in a way we gave people sort of a visitation and a memorial tonight just to do this. Well, we've gotten, a, we, there, there's been a, a, several comments on the YouTube chat of people that just really found, uh, whether it was that story or just the episode, very, very awesome. They were, they were like, oh, which, which warms our hearts to know that, that we're all kind of sharing this moment together. And again, like I said, just the amount of people uh, catching this podcast live has been so meaningful. Now, uh, I think a, a good chance to, to do before I move on is uh, well, one last thing real quick. I want to look at the YouTube chat to make sure I don't miss any comments. I know uh, um, Coach McClinic, he had also said, young man, that was awesome. Maria said, I like 67 the best with obituary to uh, uh, you know, commenting on the photos. So I just want to make sure we're getting all those. Uh, we're going to answer the closing part. I'm going to finish the show with a photo slideshow with music in the background. So the last, I don't know, I want to say two minutes of the show, we're not going to say a word, and I'm going to end with a tribute photo. But before we do that, I want to do like what we usually do on our podcast, guys, and we always do the closing thoughts. So uh, really, I know, again, Kathy, a lot to process, but if you had to kind of sum up your emotions or just, you know, from this, this experience overall, what would it be? This was beautiful. Um, I, I just, I loved it. I'm sure everyone here thought this was so wonderful. Um, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I apologize. I don't have, you know, a lot of words right now, but um, I know that John's feeling this right now and feeling all the love and the memories that you're sharing, his journey, his story. It's a really, really powerful thing and it is hard to put into words. Um, so I just wanna thank you both for telling the stories and, uh, and showing the pictures and really, really appreciate you know you doing this tonight and giving folks a glimpse into to John's life. Yeah, really well said, Kathy. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll kind of go first, Robbie. I'll let you finish the closing thoughts. And honestly, uh, when we do podcast shows and, and we've learned so much over the years is we, we, there's a lot of planning that goes in behind it. There, there's a lot of trying to organize conversations, interviews with people. But when we do that, we always like to provide people a plan. Like we'll give them questions and, and different topics because we want our, we want our guests to feel comfortable. We want our audience to feel comfortable. We want it to be genuine at the same time. And, and we went into this, this conversation tonight with just the story uh, mapped out. Nothing else was planned like a segment here or there or whatever. We did want to share some photos, but we didn't know how we were going to do it. We just kind of threw something together. But uh, I, I, loved, I loved every bit of it. I mean, it felt good to, I was worried. My biggest worry was I, I didn't think I was going to, uh, I didn't think I was going to, and Robbie, I got your message. I'm just going to comment on that real quick. Okay. Uh, but uh, 
but I, I didn't I didn't think I was going to make it through the story beforehand. I was afraid I was going to break down some parts. And Robbie, the part that you read about, uh, you know, why we fought him so passionately. I remember when I would try to read that to myself after writing it, like no matter what, how many times parts I would always break down, but you like solidly hit it and got through it. And that made me more comfortable having Robbie there. And even though, like Robbie said, even though organically, originally I wrote that in the perspective of myself, and it's been revised a little bit for the service. Not only does it feel better to have that version, it felt right. Like it felt like it was supposed to be there. But on top of that, everything that we talked about before that, everything that we talked about after that and shared in pictures was meaningful. It was really cool to see all those pictures of Becky. Some of those videos, especially the videos too, because we got to hear John's voice again. And, and the last time I've heard the resemblance of his voice was in the OR just through his body doing it and not him actually doing it. But that's not how I wanted to like be my last memory of hearing his voice. So to me, during our tribute show, it's much better to hear him singing a pop song to his uh, infant daughter uh, to, as, a, as, a, as a great memory to have there. So that's the best way I can sum up. It's been special and more than anything, the amount of people and the support that everybody's had for him, I, I can't stress that enough how much it means because it's it's made this process uh, more bearable to try to get through because of all the people messaging. And I know you all mean well, so please don't take it wrong that you're you asking questions. It's just that when people do, I just feel that urge that I want to give you a response. And when I can't, it, it irks me. So uh, anyways, Robbie, uh, closing thoughts for you. How do you summarize everything? Well, Coach Tonsoni, he's checked on us a lot the last few days, and so has Kathy. Uh, I, I think that, um, in a way, Ben, people were curious of how you and I were doing, how mom was doing, and the family doing. By by tuning in on the live feed, you're, you're getting that answer. You, you're getting a, a really raw and detailed um, version, maybe more than you bargained for about how things were going. But for us, it, it helps, like Ben said, to get that out. So it means a lot to do this pseudo memorial that we just did I, I want to brag on Kathy a little bit too is that yeah it's possible to get really attached to people you haven't met in person we still haven't met we were supposed to be at the first ever Indiana football game this year against the Hilltoppers which would have been fitting because I live next to Bowling Green we we're supposed to be in person but just so you know um, one of the first um you know people that I messaged the other night like I messaged all the people that were important in our family but I got I also called Kathy up, um, you know, when everything was going on and told her and everything. And Ben and I both told Kathy we love her. We see Kathy just like family and a sister to us because we she's been consistently checking on us multiple times every day. Coach Sonsoni has, our family members and friends have. And we want to get to everybody. It's, it's just that you don't hardly have time to be able to do all of it yet. And it can be pretty exhausting. But just to, to know that overwhelming support is there just makes it amazing. Kathy, the fact that you came here tonight was incredible. Anybody that was in the, in the live chat watching was amazing, too, to have family and friends. If Even though it's on social media, for some reason you wanted a more printed copy, which we intend on doing for um, our aunt and uncle and mom, to have that story on tangible paper. Um, some people are like me. I still like re I love reading a physical book. And having that means a lot to have something tangible. Kathy, thank you for being part of tonight. Thank you for everybody listening uh, to us. Um, cut up a little bit, tell some serious stuff. And just thank you for honoring our, our brother with us. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, good good way to sum it up, Robbie. And just to reiterate what you said, or to, to – uh, to agree with you like uh, Kathy have been a lot for you to join us tonight and be here I know you you, you didn't yeah get a lot of opportunities to say a lot again I think you're probably used to that because me and Robbie are just to you know talkers so much but you did we loved your comments and again it's, it's a lot for you to also have to take into because like Robbie said again biggest compliment for Kathy is she's family to us too she's like a sister to us and we love her and and she's been so supportive in this uh, she's one of the people honestly whenever I had the my final where my cup just ran ran over emotionally uh, uh sunday night before he had passed away whenever the donor thing didn't work out kathy was one of them that that was uh that was like basically trying to come to the rescue she was she's what i what i call the rescue squad because of uh the medical field and background there kathy was one of them amanda pavelka kagan uh, our friend there, our, my friends at work, Brian Pickens, Cody McCoy, Tina Norman, uh, uh, Sean Wright, a, a bunch of other people that were just 
uh, numerous, numerous people that I can't name. I'm just naming a, you know, a handful of people there. My, you know, Becky, uh, my aunt, uh, Judy, and, and everybody was trying to help like uh, deal with that. I could face that. And because of all that is what helped me get through it and then find peace in the long run. But overall, uh, again, uh, the support for John through this entire six year process has been, has been amazing and, and overwhelming in a good way. And, I, and honestly, the whole Facebook thing, to be honest with you, I know people shouldn't share so much uh, personal stuff on Facebook, but my mentality going in was there's going to be a lot of people wondering, there's going to be a lot of questions about John Matt, and I'm okay with that, but I can't convey it all efficiently if I'm trying to just privately message everybody. So I, I really do hope that everyone in our family uh, understands why I was doing that, why friends or family or people that think that I was wrong for doing that understand it's just because I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. I can't, I can't have 350 people texting me privately asking the same question and me having to respond to the same one versus just putting it out there and tagging family in it and just, you know, sharing it. That way we're all, like a lot of people have said, you know, you're, we're kind of going on this journey together. So you guys were like there with us, neck and away. You were rooting for John, just like I was rooting for John. And you felt that sting of defeat like I did and Robbie did and our family. So it, it was almost like living that it's real. Like I'm talking about like it being a story, but we're talking about real, real life here. And even though it would have been a beautiful thing to do, donate, obviously it didn't work out. It's just, but that's just how, how it ended up happening. But anyways, we're going to close Again, there's going to be a little bit of a pause uh, for the, on the audio. Uh, for those that are on the podcast platforms, you're just going to hear it ending music, but that's actually visually doing a slideshow. So you're going to hear about two minutes or so of audio that's going to play. So instead of our normal show theme in, that's going to be the end of our show that you'll hear. And then for those that are on the YouTube, you're going to be seeing the pictures of John. And then we're going to end with a tribute photo that shows his birth year and the and the the year that in time or date or I mean the date and stuff that he had passed away. So, uh, but again, thank you all so much for that. And we love you all very much. And again, we, we find we're finding peace because John Matt has finally found peace. Thank you. Ben, maybe you do need to unmute your mic. I don't think the music's hearing. I was afraid your mic might interfere with what was going on. One second. I got to close that PowerPoint thing out because it's... Yeah. I was going to say, Ben, you might have to unmute your mic. Keep your mic unmuted yeah, because it may not pick it up. It's just that if your way. voice gets too close to it, it's going to think that it needs to pick that up. And then your B's turned on on your voice mixer, right? Yeah. I'm just going to close all these windows out. For some reason, I'm having trouble just getting these. Okay. Uh, technology. One second. If we can't get the music work, we'll just play Stop the slideshow. This time, my power point's freezing up. Like it wouldn't freaking go. I'm going to have to leave the mic. Uh, uh, like I said, that's, I'm pretty sure that's why it's doing that because when I mute, it's muting everything on my end. So sorry for that. Obviously, just like real life, everything doesn't go smoothly. So again, uh, we're going to do the slideshow. It, it should work now. Robbie, Kathy, if you see any issues on your end, you know, feel free to say so. Again, I'm going to uh, load up the PowerPoint again and make sure that's working. I'll make sure I can open this and stuff. Okay, hopefully this works this time. Okay, we're going to go ahead and try this again. Everybody, thank you for, for all your support.